What are they booing about? Well, I don't know. Well, welcome to the Mindful Cranks. We're using your mind as not necessarily a bad thing. And we're being cranky can actually be mindful. Let's crank it up. This episode, I spoke with Matthew Ingram, author of Retreat, How the Counterculture Invented Wellness, recently published this summer by Repeater Books. Reading Matthew's book was like taking a walk down memory lane for me, revisiting many of the key figures of the counterculture, and discovering many unknown connections between such figures, as well as hidden histories, shadow elements, and colorful vignettes. We covered a lot of ground, from Mohandas Gandhi to R.D. Ling, from the German nature boys to the Dalai Lama being asked what he thought about LSD. We uncover and shed light on some of the simplistic and naive views of the counterculture, particularly how the ego was made into a boogeyman, and how the whole movement devolved into a kind of hedonism an attachment to a romantic sense of the mystical. A fanatic record collector, Matthew Ingram started blogging as Wabat in 2003. The cult blog featured in articles such as The Guardian, Slate, Fact, and The Wire. He ended up writing features and reviews for The Wire and a column for Fact. In this period, Matthew co-founded the Disincensus Forum with Mark K. Punk Fisher and released critically acclaimed music as Wobot. His last project was an animated documentary about vitamin C, and he also worked as a writer for the Teletubbies. I think you'll really enjoy this far-ranging conversation. Well, I'd like to welcome Matthew Ingram uh, to the Mindful Cranks podcast. I have been... Uh, uh, waiting eagerly to interview Matthew. So welcome, Matthew. Oh, hi, Ron. Thanks very much for having me on board. Yeah, we, uh, we're going to talk about Matthew's new wonderful book called Retreat, How the Counterculture Invented Wellness, recently published by Repeater Books this year. Um, but I think before we you know, dive into the book, uh, I think it'd be worthwhile talking a little bit or telling us a little bit about... Uh, your background. Right. Um, well, I, um, before, it was a, not an obvious um, thing to end up writing this book for me. Um, I had um, previously read, written a lot about music and, and that involved, um, uh, part of that was a, a sort of, a, became a sort of exploration of the counterculture um, and so although my previous project to this was an animation about vitamin C, which was health related, um, the uh, the it was actually the connection was the counterculture and, and my interest in that from a musical perspective that led into this. So um, so so that's really my background. And I'm a, an animator by by trade. So I so I, uh, I work as a sort of designer, a motion graphic designer. Um, 3d person for and if for i recall living, so. reading in your one of your bios that you worked on the program the children's program teletubbies that's right yeah yeah i've, I've had a i've had a few little bit strange bits and pieces that i've done over the years and 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 that was one of them another i've always had kind of projects on the go and for instance another one was um in the early 90s i i flew a techno sound system to west africa and and made a documentary about um electronic music in, in africa and through raves in west africa in the early 90s so I, i've always had funny projects on the go and this is another one i guess yeah really really interesting background well i want to tell you how much uh i enjoyed reading your book um it isn't short it's like 450 plus pages but it's an easy read. It's very engaging. And I learned so much about the backstories and the connections among many of these luminaries that influenced me 
such as R.D. Lang and Carl Jung, Alan Watts, many, many more. So uh, mm. what led you to embark on this journey to write this book? Well, um, the first thing was um, I kept coming across um, little what I would describe as health methodologies that were related to the counterculture. So, for instance, I, I became very interested in R.D. Lang um, and anti-psychiatry. And so I sort of notched that up. And then I, I came across um, transcendental meditation, obviously, um, through um, the Beatles and, and interest in, in that sort of musical. And so so then I sort of chalked, oh, there's another one. And then um, I came across things like macrobiotic foods. Um, and obviously that was uh, also wrapped up in um, in the counterculture. So I sort of started building a little pile of um, of little method health methodologies that were related to it. And obviously the, uh, the whole aspect of LSD, which is obviously totally wrapped up with the counterculture, obviously came out of a sort of background of psychiatry. Um, and then, uh, so I had these little sort of four or five little islands that I thought, um, and but in the process of writing the book, I began to realize or come to understand how they all related to each other. And I think that was the surprising thing was how um, all of these separate methodologies and, and there's a whole load of them. There's a whole aspect of sexual repression. There's, um, you know, meditation in, in a broader sense. There's, you know, the, the influx of um, Eastern philosophy and, you know, uh, the, the beats and, and and they all seemed to actually quite surprisingly fold into each other um and um, but but that was the background to the book was discovering these little islands that i could see would be an interesting way of talking about the counterculture yeah and that term counterculture um it's really interesting because it was a term coin coined by uh theodore uh, rozak whom I remember reading in the early 70s mm. uh, his book, uh, The Making of a Counterculture, which gave us many new ideas. It talked about uh, all the practices, the various worldviews mm. with its communal and spiritual values. But in your book, you argue that the idea of wellness is a direct inheritance of the counterculture. Can you say more about that? Well, Yes. Um, I mean, in one sense, it was a, a decision for because originally I was I was going to do um, it was going to be health and the counterculture. But then it became it was obviously made more sense to talk about wellness because that's the background to the things meditation and yoga that we know so well with regards to wellness. And in fact, wellness just made just ended up making a lot more sense. But for instance, if, if one looks at um, a figure such as uh, Kabat-Zinn, who I know you've um, written a lot about, um, and, and this, this in fact, I, I, I came through recent research, it, it becomes so obvious how his background, his roots are directly as a kind of second generation or third generation coming out of this, this scene. So his kind of the figures who he looks up to or is associated with i was very surprised because i hadn't explored my even in my cutoff points like 1976 but you know i, I was very um I, it was remarkable to see how the assumptions and the ideas of that mindfulness which is obviously the you know the totemic um sort of technology of wellness um, was was entirely coming out of this kind of cultural background. Um, so sort of characters like uh, uh, Jack Cornfield and Dean Ornish and pretty much the whole range of, of uh, Kabat-Zinn's connections or base level were from the counterculture, in including himself, actually. I think he was a, a protester against Vietnam at one point. Um, so... So, 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 so it did actually end up making a lot of sense, but in the way of these things, it, it wasn't originally what, you know, I, it was more of an expedience that I, I chose to talk about mindfulness, I mean, to, uh, wellness as opposed to health. 
Well, that brings up a follow-up question um, that I wanted to ask you. Would you agree that the counterculture's idea of wellness and spirituality are very different than what we see today? What I mean by that, that there seems to have been uh, a massive uh, capitalist co-optation, which has led to sort of superficial salves such as McMindfulness that I talk yeah. about. Um, I think that it's, um, it's, it's almost like sort of Chinese whispers um, that in terms of what happened with, I mean, the first generation of that, that picked up um, Eastern philosophy, there was a sense that there was a very real engagement. I mean, one could be quite critical of people like DT Suzuki. I mean, in the book, I, I take quite a soft line on him because you know, looking at the full range of um, the, the Buddhist texts that I've read, he, although he's a controversial man in, in very many senses, he, he does have an authentic background in Buddhism. Um, but in fact, he is a kind of um, a very good example to, to pick up in a sense, because and it's certainly something I talk about in the book is that the, the thing that he doesn't really bring to America. So this is sort of the first wave of the Chinese whisper is that he they don't really push non-attachment as an idea. And I don't I'm not exactly sure why this is. I think it, it might be because it's an easier sell. Um, but it's uh, that a lot of the 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 core of the philosophy does survive the first move over. But non-attachment is like the one of the first casualties. So, for instance, Kerouac and Ginsberg can talk of them about themselves very, in, a, in very sincerely as being Buddhist. Well, you know, for instance, Ginsberg is a poly drug abuser and, and Kerouac is an alcoholic. And yet they think of themselves as very authentically Buddhist. And, and then, you know, there's, there's kind of a gallery of whispering um, supporters, the likes of uh, Trungpa, who, who actually come over, Chogram Chungpa, the uh, Tibetan leader, who actually kind of enforce that and endorse that um, position, the whole way that crazy wisdom was the Tibetan philosophy of, of a, sort of a niche a philosophy of Tibetan wisdom. They, uh, they, can, they kind of endorse that licentiousness. They, it kind of goes with the sort of the high rolling aspect of the counterculture. So, so there is a sense that some of the, the stronger ideas and the more central ideas come off, but I think non-attachment is the, the first casualty. But then certainly I think the second wave comes out of the back end of Esalen. The, the second wave uh, of, of, of Esalen or post-Esalen ideas, so for instance, Primal Scream or um, EST or, or, or these methodologies, they bring it more back to a much more personal perspective. Uh, they, they, they remove not just non-attachment, but, but any sense of a higher ethics. And the counterculture was very strong on ethics. I mean, they, it was really about sort of the transformation of society. Um, but it then at this sort of second phase, you know, it became much more about, uh, you know, shine, making, you know, shiny little cogs, to, that worked well in the machine. Um, so, so, so you know, it's a sort of a, an ongoing process. But by the time it reaches um, Kabat Zinn, who's like a sort of a third wave, um, you know, non-attachment is completely gone, um, and there's very little engagement with. Um, I mean, you know, there is a there is a moral aspect to to Kabat Zinn, but it's very much a kind of a patterner. Um, and it's very much about, you know, personal transformation, but without the uh, implication that, that that would have a role within society, um, which was really the counterculture's message. Yeah, I like a quote that you make here early on in the book um, that, that relates to this shiny cog uh, comment. <laughs> uh, you say mm. there is an Orwellian quality of doublespeak to the idea of wellness in that it, it is, to a large degree, the shiny rebranding of suffering. This is a suffering to which quick fixes can be marketed. 
So I, I think that really captures maybe this, maybe even fourth or fifth wave that we're seeing today. Um, yeah, yeah. But let's let's go back in time because this is what I really, really enjoyed about your book is just sort of I I think the hidden history or the overlooked history in terms of some of the roots of the counterculture, and you trace back the conf- confluence of wellness and co- and the counterculture to going as far back as the 19th century, starting uh, with Mohandas Gandhi, which I found fascinating. Why, why Gandhi? Why why was he so important to the to this sort of s- the seeds of the counterculture? Um, I think in the, in the first instance, um, he was very his mission was very much involved um, personal transformation. I think that's one aspect of it. Uh, and the very sort of the concept of nonviolence, you know, has at its core the idea that of what you as an individual don't do. Also, Gandhi was obviously very wrapped up in 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 health in the ideas of, of actual health. So, you know, he was a, a vegetarian. Um, he uh, he wrote extensively on health. Um, his book on health. I mean, it's eccentric, but it's still fascinating. It's still he still believes that you know the the, the diet people's diet has a great effect on you know, their mentality. Um, and he also um, there's a, there's a very curious uh, crossover point with Kingsley Hall um, in the, the first place, which is where the anti psychiatry movement grew out of. He visits Kingsley Hall, um, and it's it's always uh, whenever I've read sort of histories of Kingsley Hall, there's sort of two histories, which is one in the 60s where R. D. Lang set up you know, the, this anti-psychiatric community there. And then there's a sort of added on, there's this another remarkable bit of history, which is Gandhi, but there's never been any sense that there was perhaps some relation to the two. But he's obviously uh, an icon of, of the counterculture in the sense that of what he rese- represents for overthrowing authority and, you know, thinking differently, um, and, uh, and obviously his his roots, his connections to theosophy as well. I mean, the first place Gandhi came across actual Indian ideas in terms of um, the religion and the Eastern philosophy was actually in London. Yeah, that's um, really that's was, really, uh, in- really interesting that he had to go to London <laughs> yeah. to uh, discover yeah. Indian philosophy. That's right, and all the and all the uh, he was uh, given um, the Bhagavad Gita by uh, two sort of brothers, um, Theosophist brothers on, well, I said brothers, um, on the uh, on the Farringdon Road in the vegetarian restaurant. And obviously the Gandhi we, we know in um, the wearing the Indian clothes is a, is a later incarnation in the sense that he, you know, he dressed like a solicitor. He was a very, you know, smartly dressed man. So, so, um, but he's, he's right, you know, in, in the middle of it, but for lots of reasons, but he, you know, he forms with a few other people, you know, a, sort of a precursor to how um, you know the ideas enter the West. Yeah, you tie together a lot of threads in this particular chapter. Uh, you talk about uh, a group of men that I, I've never heard of called the German Nature Boys and uh, William James, mm. of course, uh, and yes. then uh, the American transcendentalists such as uh, Emerson and Walt Whitman and Nietzsche. Mm. Um, th- mm. That's really quite an interesting thread of characters there. Um, who who yes. were these German nature boys, and what was that all about? Um, well, they, uh, they there was a, a sort of industrial revolution era um, in Germany. There were um, there was a very sort of strong grassroots movement um, trying to get away from pollution and you know unhealthy living, um, and they uh, there was a few key characters like um, Gustav Grasser um, and they were people who followed after them who obviously more obviously countercultural like Hermann Hess who picked up a lot of those ideas but and even for instance Albert Hoffman had connections to the um, 
he was a he was an early he was a sort of wonder vogel walker uh, which was another stream of the um so so there's a whole load of them in in, in germany and then there's a, some who came over to the United States. There's a man called Arnold Errett who who came to the United States to into to meet Lester Burbank, who was the great sort of um, Californian horticulturalist, and then got stuck in America, and then he introduced his mucus-free diet to to uh, the states, which was one of um, Steve Jobs was, uh, was an oh, yeah. adherent of, which is obviously why they have Apple. So. Um, and but there was a, also after the war there were a whole load of them who um, who basically got the got the boat over and um, got the road box cars to California and um, just lived in the hills uh, pretty much continued the uh, the um, the activities that they were leading in in Germany in California where I think it was probably much more pleasant. So and a lot of the um, the commune of Ascona uh, is a very another very important part of that um, you know um, that scene as well. So it's, it's sort of a, uh, the current they, they all they also said they all come to America and then there's a few Americans sort of, sort of join in. So so that by by this era of the 60s there's um there's like a second generation of of people like. Um, uh, Maximilian Sickinger, and um, I guess most famous of all is Eden Abes, who everybody knows from Nature Boy, and, and these were like uh, I've always been well known. And there's a uh, as the Gypsy Boots is another one. The, these guys have always been very well known as proto hippies, but it was a it was a movement from Germany, and and it, Hermann Hesse is, is role in all this is interesting because obviously, you know, Steppenwolf and Siddhartha are the kind of you know, ur texts for the counterculture and certainly for, you know, the Eastern leaning um, counterculture. So um, it's one of those just big currents. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. You also mentioned how people like uh, Jim Morrison and David Bowie, these, mm. these rock stars, uh, were influenced by uh, Nietzsche's writings. Is that right? That's right. I mean, he was a big... Um, it was a, you know, it was a, a big thing for that sort of um, will to power. Um, uh, Nietzsche's, uh, he, he almost forms, and and I think as well, you know, essentially um, Jung and Freud were both were very involved with Nietzsche, and and, and for for me, it, it, for in, us in the book, um, you know, was sort of the whole structure of the book, because there's so much material that that I covered, you know, there was very important to have some kind of sense of synthesis because otherwise there's you know there's there's so much history there's so much information so you know i took a, a view that that you know on the on the one hand you have what i would call um philosophies of the self so things like the vedanta some aspects of buddhism not all aspects of buddhism and you know um things like lsd psychiatry which are very much involved in a sort of um you know, you know, uh, psychic exploration, you know, uh, ego death and those sort of things. So that sort of forms on the left. And, and Nietzsche is very useful for talking about the other end of the spectrum, which is the ego. Um, and so Nietzsche's big, big thing essentially is um, the validity of the ego and the importance of the ego. And, 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 and the discourse of those 70s rock stars was, was very much about, you know, reimagining the ego. And it's all a bit of a um, in that era. It's all a bit of a big, a big melange, and you know you don't always get the sense that everyone's making sense of it, but it's, it's in the mix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll come back to that theme about uh, the importance of uh, material relative world in uh, uh, versus right. this sort of uh, spiritual bypassing. Um, let's yeah. let's uh, turn now to the beats, which. Um, this is a really fascinating chapter. Uh, obviously, the fi such figures as Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and Neil Cassidy, and uh, mm. I found it really fascinating that <clears throat> for the Beats, I really didn't know this that Freud's work in psychoanalysis, uh, which now gets a really bad rap, 
figured yeah. prominently in their intellectual framework. Um, mm-hmm. Can you tell us? A, I mean, we'll get to psychoanalysis in a little, probably in our next. Right, sure. uh, but uh, I mean that that was news to me. This whole idea mm. that they were really deep into psychoanalysis. Yes, I mean, um, and and Wilhelm Reich was a was a very big one. Um, too. I mean, uh, Ginsburg was was actually keen as mustard to be analysed by Reich, um, who obviously at that at that time would have been understood as a disciple of Freud's. Um, Burroughs was was obsessed with Reich as well. He had a you know a, his own orgone accumulator, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they're all um, they're all uh, you know it's very much the the discussion is is very much about. Um, even the sense of automatic writing and all of these ideas are very much related to therapy um, and self-expression. And Ker- Kerouac, um, Kerouac and, was a, a practitioner of that that method of writing, right? That's right. He he he, he was, um, you know, he he would he would write. Uh, he um, he would have a had a sort of almost like a wall, a roll of roll of wallpaper on his on his typewriter. And he would just he would just type and type and type and type and type and type and type, and type uh, with a view to just you know not even thinking. Um, he wouldn't even ha- didn't have a rig up, so he would change pages. He just had a just a gigantic roll of paper. So on the road is is actually written on big rolls of paper. Wow. As opposed to, yeah, he you know, seems like such thinking. a tragic figure, uh, and mm. I, I didn't know that. Uh, my friend Bob Thurman, I, I didn't know that he wrote an introduction oh. to Wake Up. Um, yes, no, he, 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 Bob's a very, Bob Thurman's, a, or Robert Thurman for me, yeah. is, a, is a very important, um, you know, node in, in the whole the whole scene. I yeah. mean, he's, uh, um, he comes up in, a, in the book a number of, on a number of occasions. What? But uh, yeah, he, uh, he wrote the introduction to Wake Up and uh, sort of actually gave i think kerouac you know um quite a lot of you know praise in terms of how how he he understood the dharma and um picked off things that a lot of people don't understand or or misunderstand so um yeah and and ginsburg um can you tell well i i i I didn't i didn't know that he first did lsd right here in palo alto uh california at the uh uh, Stanford Research Institute, the program run by the CIA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, tell right. us the story about Ginsburg and the Dalai Lama. I thought that was f- really remarkable. Oh yes. Well, he he he's uh, he curses himself for it, but when he when he visited, um, he he was in, um, in in India with Peter Olofsky, his his lover, and also Jack Snyder, um, and um, Jack Snyder's um, um, partner at that that time, um, and they they managed to get an audience with the with the Dalai Lama at Dharamsala, um, and um, Ginsburg asked him all about the um, Tibetan use of psychedelics, uh, the monks' use of psychedelics, um, and um, I think the Dalai Lama probably agreed to the the his, happening as a historical fact, but. His remark to, to Ginsburg was that, you know, it, it um, you know, that there, there were real psychic states, but that the, the pursuit of them didn't um, lead to growth, essentially. And so, um, you know, I think Ginsburg felt a little bit foolish that he'd uh, gone all this way to ask the Dalai Lama and years this questions about psychedelics. And I think in, in years later, he kind of cursed himself for, for the missed opportunity but you know it's um, I think it's not probably not that often that you get the Dalai Lama to talk about um, LSD so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably good to have on record right yeah. well, well we'll talk about LSD in more depth too now um, um, well let's go back to psychoanalysis because as you point out in the chapter on psychoanalysis that as we were saying, that Freud's work was usually not associated with the counterculture, but uh, many of the countercultural ideas can be traced back to Freud uh, and his protégés, obviously Carl Jung, but many others, yeah. uh, 
Norman Brown, as you said, William Reich, uh, R.D. Lang, uh, even yeah. uh, the primal scream therapist, uh, Irving Janoff. Right. Whom I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I was actually into his work in the 1970s, uh, briefly. Huh. <laughs> um, so let's start with Freud. And uh, I really like to point out uh, that what was unique about Freud's work and the ideas he was drawing from were fields that were outside of the field of medicine. For example, his fascination with uh, ancient Greek mythology. So Freud's uh, mm. psychoanalysis was, as you very astutely point out, a cultural meme. And uh, what I found interesting was the, the notion, Freud's notion of polymorphously perverse concept uh, and how that uh, was taken yes, up right. by uh, yeah. the neo-Freudians. Uh, can you say a little bit why that was important to yes. uh, this sort of sexual revolution and everything that was starting to happen in the 60s? Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the polymorphous perverse, perverse was, was also very um, important for the feminists. Um, the, the, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really fantastic theory. Um, which is essentially that, and it, I, I think it's um, it's a better, and it was one that was used by um, Marcuse and Norman O'Brien, who were the, um, the Freudian Marxists of the 60s. They, they really picked it up and, uh, and ran with it. But the polymorphous perverse is, is the idea that um, when you're an infant, essentially, your whole engagement with reality is essentially, or for want of a better word, erotic or, or sensual. And so your your so taste so sucking and and um you know um, defecation and all these things uh, are a uh, uh, erotic dimension of reality and that freud's essential argument is that what happens is that through the influence of society this um all over polymorphous um sensuality is um trammeled more and more and more into the genital so that it kind of shrinks uh, and then one of the one of the aspects that the feminism picked up um was that um the, the female um the female sexuality was um not so genital in that sense was that it's not all about um it's actually about the, the entire body surface so for instance and this this was very interesting with regards to the, the sexual research that came out, Kinsey, but um, this um, this research bore out the the ideas that the, the the female sexual response wasn't restricted to um, the genital areas as such, um, and so so in terms of sexual repression as an idea, which is obviously a very big motif for for the 60s for the counterculture. Um, the the Freudian Marxists were were very interested in, in the idea that you know we all ought to be regressing or or not regressing but that was certainly not the term they use but but trying to move towards a towards a, a sense of polymorph polymorphous per, perversity um, and Norman O'Brown who was um, who who wrote um, you know extensively on this was I think sort of picked up and sort of teased by his students for whether he had a polymorphously perverse sex life um but it, it's um it's just a, it's a, just a very very succinct and interesting uh, idea um so marcuse and brown they they were kind of maybe portraying the ego as a bit of an overzealous policeman of the status quo in a way that's right that's right i mean there's a, this in this era there, especially in the West, there is a, a an over overriding um, sort of denigration of the the ego or the idea of the ego. There doesn't seem yeah. to be much of an idea of the healthy ego, and so right. and Jung is actually a very useful corrective to that because you know, Jung's idea Jung isn't actually, although he talks about the universal unconscious and and what have you, he's actually much more of a 
he's much more invested in the idea of, of the healthy ego. I mean, that's what individuation is. It, it isn't this right. ego, ego death idea. Individuation, um, integration. Yeah. That's right. Uh, but I think that's, pro you know, I mean, the beatniks used to refer to, to squares, right? Uh, hmm. If you were square, it sounds like they were uh, actually onto this early on, the idea that if you were locked into your kind of overzealous uh, policeman-like ego. Uh, yes. And so the whole, this is, sounds like a precursor to the free love uh, aspect Absolutely. of the sexual revolution and the feminist revolution. Yes. That's right, yeah. Well, another uh, overlooked aspect of Freud, too, that is that he had an interest in um, Jewish mysticism and the Kabbalah. Uh, Yes. And even though he seemed very anti-religious, he wrote a lot about religion and spirituality in many ways, right? That's correct. I mean, he wrote, I mean, three three whole books on on um, on, on religious ideas. Um, no, he, he Freud was uh, very um, very interested in religion, and, and in fact, there there is a sense with psychoanalysis as a whole that. And this is interestingly picked up by um, Leary and um, and also Aldous Huxley. They made a point with their early trials of LSD that, that they wanted to actually hijack the medical establishment like Freud did with psychoanalysis. So Freud was essentially the straight man. Um, he, he Well, not the straight man. He, he was very much trying to perpetuate this idea of psychoanalysis as a science and all this kind of, um, which which we're still we're still lumbered with really, um, and, um, and with with a view to sort of penetrating um, that domain of, of culture, um, and again it's it's very similar to um, the rhetoric around um, mindfulness really because yeah endless lists of uh, you know um, placebo double controlled trials and uh, you know it really is you know. It, yeah, I mean it's, uh, right. but um, but but this this is this was what Freud Freud was 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 really taking something which was very very esoteric and coming out of you know hypnotism and um, mesmer and 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 and, and, um, and turning it into something that you know that was um, you know it could be used in a yeah. in a sort of clinical right. context. The whole biomedical uh, paradigm. Yeah. Well, that brings up Carl Jung then, getting back to this idea um, that. Uh, of ego death and you know many of his mystical experiences that he encountered with the unconscious uh, was this whole idea of the dissolution of the ego into the self with a big That's s right. not the little s um, but what i found interesting too is why do you think jung was against lsd and and mescaline why do, what, what, what what was your thinking um, i i think he sort of he forms a group with a not not an in, insignificant um, range of people who I think had experiences or non ordinary experiences without the use of LSD, um, and I, and oh, I think right. I think that prejudiced them against it in the sense that I don't think he thought that it was essential. I think he probably saw a lot in therapy in the sense that certainly you know Freudian or, or Jungian therapy do involve to some degree, um, they do break down the personality, and and I think a, a, a therapist will, will often come across quite sort of a sort of a normative, non ordinary experiences. A certain the whole focus on dreams and um, dream material. Um, I think that you know that it's so close to uh, the LSD experience that I think he his personal breakdown. Um, when uh, there's, a, there's a there's a he sort of he essentially in his own sort of words he sort of answered the call um, to the to the self and and he had a sort of a very cataclysmic um, you know nervous breakdown um, and had had a lot of hallucinations and a, a real sort of break from reality what normally would be described as a kind of a schizophrenic episode. I think his experience of that and his the struggles of, of returning to normal life, I think, have certainly prejudiced him against the LSD experience when that 
journey is 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 very trivialized in a sense in that you take lsd and it has an effect and then it wears off um whereas i think Jung spent probably yeah four or five years or more putting himself back together again um but he also he also saw um he also saw mescaline used in labs um in switzerland um he he saw peyote eaters in mexico um, and he, he just didn't take a very, he didn't have a very good view of it. I think, in fact, if he'd taken LSD, he probably would have been, um, he would have recognized the experience, but he, he would have seen it as a kind of a SATS um, spiritual experience, just by virtue of the fact that it, you know, it, it has a beginning, a very sort of quite easily definable beginning and end. Um, so he, he was, he's against it very strongly. And it, it's actually, there's a real bugbear for people who are interested on um, the sort of the transpersonal psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts, and um, a lot of people who are writing around this area. They, they, they almost refuse to believe that Jung would be against LSD, um, but uh, he absolutely very clearly was. Yeah. Yeah, and he also seemed to be very wary of eastern religions and westerners uh taking up uh, eastern practices mm. i uh, i think i think you tell this story in the book about when he was in india he had the opportunity to meet uh ramana yes, uh, marahashi right. so i don't know if marahashi, i'm pronouncing yes. that uh and he refused he declined the yes. invitation i think he uh, saying mm. that well something like he said well i don't really need to see him because uh, I don't yeah. know. I don't know exactly what he, he said, was. Yeah. What? So he also had a bias, yes. or not a bias, but a predilection against uh, uh, Westerners getting too deep into Eastern philosophies and Eastern uh, meditative he, he, practices. He, he right? definitely did. Um, he, he, although he starts off um, theorizing very strongly about k Kundalini energy, um, he takes a yeah, I think it was. I think when he when he visited India, I think he was having a lot of dreams. Of actually, ironically, about the, the England. Um, I think he was very much in search of a kind of, um, for him, an indigenous, uh, um, an indigenous spirituality. I mean, his his big theory, with which is, which actually kind of by the end of his career, you, you could sense that if he lived a little longer, he would have sort of pulled it apart was that the the uh, the man from the east or the man or the, or the woman from the east approaches um you know the idea these ideas from the other side so you know his idea for instance um was to re read the tibetan book of the dead in reverse so rather than see it as a journey from the ego to the self sorry rather than see it as a journey from the self to the ego um as in you uh, become incarnated that you he would see it as a journey um from you know uh, the, the self to the ego so essentially I'll, I'll try and make that a bit clearer but um his assumption was that everybody in the far east or, or the east was in a sense spiritualized by default and you know immersed in the self or the, with as you say with a big s but that um the the journey for the for the eastern man was towards a sense of individuation where his view on 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 the west was that we're all locked in our egos and therefore the journey that we need to make is towards a sense of this to the the self to this this big s to the expansion huh. so he viewed it as a kind of an inversion and that colored his ideas yeah. of um the value of indian and chinese and japanese thought um because he saw that it was appropriate for that context but not for the westerner um, uh -huh. his his, uh, his idea of christianity however because his father was a uh, uh, a pastor in Switzerland, but his idea of, of Christianity is is completely bonkers. 
Um, so he actually, and then obviously he sort of seems to want to ignore the fact that, you know, Christianity is in itself a, a Middle Eastern cult. So, you know, it, it's a sort of, a, a, I've just recently read his answer to Job, which is his kind of, his his understanding of the life of Jesus and um, how the story of Job in the Old Testament relates to that. And, and it, it, it was absolutely, it was outrageous at the time and he lost all his um, clergy friends because of it because he, he so his his um his cynicism towards um eastern religion as it grew was slightly confused you know, if, if, if that if that makes sense yeah well that's that he certainly was interested in it in uh, given that he wrote uh, the introductions to many seminal uh early english uh buddhist uh, text um yeah, you tell, uh, you know, I'm going to jump really quick back to uh, uh, Irving Janoff. Um, it's, yeah, I was a freshman in college at the time, and I remember um, bringing the book up to one of my psychology professors, and he said, oh, this guy's crazy. What are you doing with that book? <laughs> but uh, you, you, uh, you tell a funny story about uh, Jack Cornfield. Yeah. Um, running of a Pasana retreat with some primal screamers. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I would imagine it's probably, if it wasn't, if it wasn't Esalen, it, it probably would have been um, um, Naropa. Um, I, he's, um, I think the, the cornfield tells a story of, of all the uh, primal screamers uh, yelling their heads off and, and, um, uh, and cornfield saying, look, for once, why don't you guys just, just not scream, but just, just sit there with it. It's kind of a sort of a proto mindful, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Vipassana, um, yeah. With Vipassana, um, and um, yeah, I think that they they had a. Uh, I think he reports a number of them had a, have a had a revelation with, with with not screaming their their heads off. But so it's obviously it's, it's Lenin. It's obviously John <laughs> Lennon who uh, who who gave um, you know Yanov his you know the ticket to ride. I think. Yeah. Okay, you bring up Mark Fisher. Uh, hmm. That really uh, was. Uh, rang a bell for me because certainly his work on capitalist realism had a hu huge influence on, uh, on me, especially his analysis uh, on the privatization of stress, mm. which I wrote about in McMindfulness. Yeah. What was your connection to Mark uh, Fisher? I'm just curious. Um, well, we were, we both, we were um, both well, essentially bloggers. Um, and oh, okay. he was a friend we were both essentially the two of us uh, were essentially acolytes of a, a very well-known music journalist called Simon Reynolds. So um, Mark and I were like his, essentially his proteges. Um, and we both started writing at the same time in Simon Reynolds's wake. Um, and, and so we got to know each other and, and Simon was actually based in New York and Los Angeles. So, the, the network that we, we that we sort of built around ourselves in the UK, it was really um, between, you know, a sort of shared field between Mark and I, certainly in, in the early days. And so we, we spent a lot of time going on walks together and um, going out to pubs together and, and you know, concerts and how we hung out a lot, um, as well as, um, you know, sort of writing in parallel. And, and that was uh, quite intense for about five years. And I think then I think Mark became more involved in, in politics um, because he was always more of a, you know, a cultural music sort of theorist before. Oh, so, interesting. But yeah. Well, well let's turn it briefly. Let, let's turn it briefly to uh, talk a little bit about Buddhism. I don't want to dwell too much on it, but uh, is it correct to say that... Your reading on the counterculture, uh, and we kind of touched on this uh, a little earlier, uh, that it had a somewhat naive or uh, misguided uh, interpretation of Buddhist doctrine, and uh, especially its quest uh, to annihilate the ego. Mm. Is that is that a yes. fair reading of what you're what, of, of how you kind of interpret it? What was going on with uh, people like Alan Watts uh, and, and other people in that, yes. in that circle? I think, I think there is a, there is a, 
I mean, Buddhism is a, is a, is a very big thing, um, and it, sort of, <laughs> and it contains a lot of things that are actually almost contradictory. Um, um, and certainly, there is a strand of Buddhism, and certainly the one, for instance, Suzuki, um, and almost co coincidentally, Trungpa. Well, there's there's other other characters, but they they. The, the strand of Buddhism that, that, that they picked up, I mean, it's it's a real strand. Of, for instance, I mean Suzuki, one of his big things is Asvagosa, and and that's very much un, unreconstructed um, Indian, uh, unreconstructed Hinduism. It's very much about you know the kind of a Vedanta idea of you know the um, the, the 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 small the, the self being a fragment of a larger self um and um and so so there is an authentic place for those ideas in the counterculture in the sense that it was it was very much preoccupied with you know ego dissolution and getting out of its head um but so certainly in the book i mean you know i ended up sort of you know this vipassana is interesting um, because, um, you know, whether or not it's authentic Buddhism, and, it, and it's an interesting thing in itself, it's an interesting question of whether, I mean, Vipassana, is, it, it's been around so long for us now that, you know, I think there's an assumption that, you know, it is an authentic form of Buddhism, but, um, you know, in a sense, it is, it is a recreation. Um, and, um, but as a current, um, that the counterculture encounters, it actually goes, runs against, um, or as I see it, it runs against, uh, you know, this kind of um, impetus to dissolve the ego. So I mean, it's, it's, it's a complicated question, but did, did, the, did the counterculture simplify um, Buddhism? Um, you yeah, know, unquestionably. I mean, everything that, everything that reached a kind of level of 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 mass population did become you know very simplified um and and, and yeah Al alan watts is sometimes uh, now referred to as pop pop sin yes yes and um his he, his book on um on zen is very is very good but he for instance he's he very much follows suzuki um yeah. Um, and and uh, the Suzuki people argue is was very influenced by Paul Karras and the you know Western ideas of yeah, it's very modernist and yeah. revisionist uh, yes. version of Zen. But uh, Alan Watts, I mean, that, he was really my first encounter mm. with Buddhism in my late teens and early twenties. I read almost all of his books. I still right. have them in paperback. Yeah. But what I found. Uh, troublesome uh, i don't know if that's the right word mm. both with dt suzuki and watts was that they they seem to downplay the practice of zazen yes which uh to me at least uh, zazen at least in my experience is the core of zen yes i mean suzuki says that um that zazen has become essentially um like uh you know, a discipline that they they teach boys like like they used to control boys at school. So he oh, yeah. talks about the uh, the the monasteries being like boarding houses essentially, and, and zazen being as a kind of form of social control. And and I think he he likes he parrots Suzuki, who thinks that zazen is, um, you know, not what Zen's about. It's not about sitting. Um, so. It's it's very difficult to, to 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 without going into you know deep into the history of of that era to see um, who's talking the truth. I think I certainly with Suzuki and in his favour, I would say that in a sense that the Zen is a, is a collision of Taoism with Buddhism, and I think that yeah. Suzuki picks up where where he could be accused of being a sort of an, what I would call an etheric Buddhist as in one who's sort of into the dissolution of the ego, he picks up currents which are very Taoist. Um, so maybe it comes from there. But Yeah, it, it sounds like D.T. Suzuki uh, kind of was a romanticizing or kind of 
like you said, uh, almost like a mystical Zen, um, this idea of dissol- dissolving into the absolute. Yes. Uh, which uh, kind of ignores the idea of two, t- two different truths or t- the, the two truths doctrine of the uh, the middle way which is uh, uh, still a non-dual philosophy that the relative and the absolute are are not two things but uh, to lose sight of the material relative world uh, can cause a lot of uh, <laughs> havoc and chaos and problems that we see in many Buddhist centers and many Buddhist teachers that have a suffered from sexual, uh, uh, well, be- becoming involved in sexual abuse and everything else. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, that's that's very true. And, and I'm sure that, you know, I make, I put it very simply or basically or um, perhaps simplistically that it seemed to me like the, the Buddha was, you know, in, in a historical sense, a, a reformer of Indian religion. And and if there was an aspect that, you know, the middle way seems to highlight it, that it is um, one that is looking to uh, avoid that collapse uh, in the ego. It seems like a, a, as a current in Indian society, it was about reintegration and, you know, not, you know, not following those practices that, you know, reduced him to a kind of a frazzled mess um, when he's kind of rescued by, you know, Sujata, the milkmaid um, and, you know, that's actually, you know, his illumination in a sense, which is that the middle, the, the essential idea of the middle way. Um, so, yeah. so, so, so certainly that was an idea which the counterculture did not get. And I think it's probably because the version of Buddhism that they were, were getting was, was this wild Tibetan idea, which was, I think, probably distorted. I mean, Trungpa seems to be a, you know, a thoroughly not in fact when you one one reads his work not in fact the brightest guy and also you know corrupt um and you know self-serving um and distorted i wouldn't say that about suzuki but you know that um you know that the, the information that the west is getting about buddhism is 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 pretty pretty skewed in, in that area yeah that was uh even as far back as the early days it, the corruption was already looming at naropa Yes, pretty ugly, uh, but uh, it was phenomenal how how many uh, people, the early teachers and the people that were drawn to Trungpa, like Ginsberg and R. D. Lang and mm. uh, Cornfield and Gregory Bateson, and uh, remarkable. I also like how you brought up uh, uh, Lama Govinda because <laughs> mm. uh, his book. Creative Meditation and Multidimensional Consciousness, another one of his books. That was almost like a Bible for me in the oh, 70s. Really? I haven't yeah. actually read that one. I, I've only oh, it's a it. remarkable book. I, I still have it. It's falling apart. Oh, I will but, dig it out. I will dig it out. I will yeah, find. you got to get that book. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't know that Ralph Metzner, who recently died, uh, mm. spent three months studying and meditating with him. I Yes. Um, I, I was a student at the Nygma Institute starting around 1982, so I just missed uh, Lama Govinda because he was in residence there Wow! right before I got there. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. a fascinating guy. Didn't, I think, didn't he believe he was a reincarnation of um, Goethe, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't recall that, but I wouldn't doubt that. Yeah. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's so much in this, uh, we don't have time to go through all of it, but um, I'd like to come back to LSD because it's such an important factor in the counterculture. Mm. Um. Let me ask you this, because this is on my this has been on my mind. Um, what do you think about LSD uh, as the role it played in you know the collective mind of the counterculture, and how is that different than let's say how it's being used by Silicon Valley technoculture, where microdosing LSD is seen a, as a way to get a productive edge versus in the counterculture, it was seen as a kind of a mind-expanding, transcendent uh, way to get to uh, a, 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 an expanded uh, sense of, of self or consciousness. Mm. Um, well, I, I guess you know. I mean, immediately, uh, you know, what you know, it makes one feel, you know, cynical. Um, I mean, I you know, to be momentarily uncynical, I think that 
you know, if there is a positive use for, for LSD outside of therapy, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty dry on the whole thing in the sense that, you know, I could see that, you know, if it has a value or psychedelics have a value for, you know, um, t- you know, people who with terminal cancer or alcoholics who are, you know, uh, without hope, then I, then I think it's probably worth a, a try. But in general, you know, I, I'm quite wary about the whole thing, which is it was quite difficult to write a book when everybody I interviewed was just over the moon about it. And all the 60s people that I spoke to just couldn't have enough good things to say about it. So it was quite strange walking into that um into that field but um you know i think that if there's a there's a role for uh you know for healing possibly then i suppose you know one could argue that there's a role for for creativity as well i i, I did a, a talk to the psychedelic society and i i kind of got picked up by somebody there that you know that you know i was only in the book certainly i i kind of only really make a case for its use in psychedelics use in you know in therapy but but you know for creativity you know i i think a lot of the music that i enjoy wouldn't have probably been made without psychedelics. oh yeah oh uh, for sure yeah pink uh, floyd is yeah that's right and and um and and and, and you know and, and the beatles uh, a lot of that you know obviously those kind of magical records they wouldn't probably have been made without it so but but uh, i guess you so and a create level of creativity i suppose but I think that the point you're making is about, you know, how, what, what the what's being done with that creativity, and you know, mi- yeah. microdosing and in Silicon Valley, and, and you know, to give you a competitive edge, you know, I, yeah, I guess I, 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 you know, I couldn't be, uh, you know, I couldn't be that enthusiastic about it, but you know, I know that some people, you know, I suppose what I suppose it depends what you're doing. I mean, you know, you know, if you're building an app to, you know you know unite the community or if you're uh you know you're trying to do something constructive or positive i guess you know maybe that's okay you know yeah well hey look, we've got to talk about your encounter because uh i i really was like glued to your book when i was reading this part about your encounter with um S- uh, stan groff who is uh mm. literally and figuratively <laughs> a giant in the field of psychedelic research and uh uh, another thing I wanted to say before we talk about that is that, I mean, you did a lot of traveling for this book in terms of coming to the U.S. and yeah. uh, going to India and and, and searching out people like uh, Stan Groff and others. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, you know, the, these are the, a lot of these people are, you know, they're they're very they're very old people in in many cases, yeah. but also I guess in a lot of cases they're very important people, and I I wrote it very much as as a nobody. And, and as a sort of on a journalistic basis, so the, the only way I could get to speak to, you know, sort of, you know, you know the Guru Bhagavan Das or, you know, or was to go and actually get on a, get a cheap flight and, you know, stay in an Airbnb and, you know, slip around. So, so, so it did involve, um, and certainly for seeing Stan Groff, I mean, I actually, I asked Stan Groff from the UK whether if I came to see um, his talk, I spent, I think, two months trying to get an email through to him. Eventually, he replied and said he was too busy to do an interview and, and I would should look at the uh, things available on his website. And then I said, look, I've, I've booked a ticket for this talk you're giving in, in Switzerland. You know, would you be able to talk to me after the uh, the talk if, um, if you had five minutes? And he was like, <laughs> no, I don't think that would be possible. But I went, um, any, I went anyway um, and just I, I, I thought, if I make myself look respectable. So I, I bought a suit um, and, uh, you know, bought a suit and a tie and made myself look like, a, you know, respectable psychedelic intellectual. And uh, <laughs> it worked. And I got, you know, 15 minutes of his time, which was very useful. Um, but, you know, no, I definitely had to go to people, you know. Oh, that's interesting. And then you went to Mount Shasta, another one of my favorite spots. Uh, yeah. Uh, that... Uh, yeah, I go there uh, at least once or twice a year. Uh, you went up there to see uh, Bhagavan Das, who is yeah. not as well known as Ram Das, right? That's right. Can you tell tell us about a bit about him and his story and and uh, yeah. his relationship to Ram Das? Well, I mean, I I think you know, obviously, when I in the book that you know I talked to people like well, I managed to get a hold of people like Prudence Faro Bruns and 
Jermaine Greer and, and, and Groff, who are pretty famous, you know, within the kind of the world that we're talking about. But um, I actually I actually had a Bhagavan Das album, um, which I bought in Amsterdam a, a long time ago. And so I was aware of him, but I didn't really clue to the connection um, with uh, with with Ramdas. Um, but then um, the more I search I did, it actually seemed like he was a, a more interesting character in many respects um, th than Ram Das. And um, I mean, I, I, I did try and go and see um, Ram Das, but, uh, you know, it was uh, I had to go to uh, it would have required going to Hawaii. And then um, he was still alive at this stage. Um, and uh, I had to pay sort of like sort of ten thousand dollars. Um, and but I was told that I he wouldn't talk he wouldn't be talking to anybody, and I, I just um, I, I actually the more I read around the subject the less I liked Ramdas. In fact, there's a kind of villain of the book. It's uh, it's Ramdas. I was quite relieved in a way that he died before the book came out because although it was written by that stage, yeah, I really didn't have much to say nice about him. I really don't think he is a particularly savoury character. Um, and but Bhagavan Das who actually came up with the term be here now which is yeah, a, he came up with the term right yeah yeah he actually came up with the term it was his his coinage and he was the guy who discovered um, neem karadi baba and he was the guy right. as well who was uh, alan ginsburg's close friend and he was the guy who who was so close to uh trungpa so he actually um although he's now a kind of a slightly marginal character i think it's one of those cases of of someone who's actually has a much larger legacy than than is appreciated. So I actually was was really pleased to uh, to actually speak to him rather than Ram Das. I got to say, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. You make an interesting claim as well. I, I think you you sort of alluded to it earlier, and I I, I do agree with you on this. That um, your observation that the counterculture really, in many ways, favored Vedanta and the mantra mm. as their preferred form of meditation. Mm. Uh, over vipassana and mindfulness, can you can you kind of uh, unpack that a bit? Because yeah. I think that's a really important point. Yeah, well, I mean, um, well, thank you. Uh, my my looking at uh, you know uh, taking a broad view across the whole field, it seemed to me that that the meditation could be you know unpacked as two different kinds of meditation. I mean, you know, there's assumption that when you talk about meditation, that everybody's doing the same thing. But for instance, you know, zazen or vipassana, where you're sitting with yourself, you're sitting with what's there, is a very different impulse to the what I describe as the kind of etheric impulse of um, of the ascent, most especially the use of the mantra. I mean, all of the big meditational techniques that were large, you know, in the middle of the counterculture, for instance, the Hare Krishnas. Um, and you know the the transcendental meditation um, all use the mantra and, and, and as a vehicle for meditation you know the effect is completely different um, you know vipassana and in fact it's often the people who talk about vipassana you know for instance cornfield or even you know kundalini psychologists like lisa nana they often talk about vipassana as a way of grounding and i i actually Think of it as a kind of you know it's obviously controversial to talk about it in these terms but only if you see the ego as a negative thing there's a kind of egoic form of meditation um, in a sense that you're actually you know you you know you're it's about integration and accepting where you are and accepting what's going on and accepting the reality of your presence whereas the effect of um I mean, you know, meditating on trying to meditate on 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 nothingness, or or meditating in a retreat situation where, you know, there's a sort of a sense of sensory deprivation, or the use of the mantra, it all has the effect of essentially um, wiping out the the sense of the ego, the sense of the self, and and what goes hand in hand with that is um, these kind of ideas of blissfulness and you know, subsumation of the self, the collapse of the ego, and all of the things that people talk about with regards to LSD. Um, so, so, so for me, there's this very different, strong difference between 
etheric meditation of which the mantra is probably the most obvious example and integral meditation for which you know i guess the vipassana is is the obvious example um you know. well that brings up tm then um mm. and uh wow what a seminal figure uh maharishi mahesh yogi was and uh just how influential he was yes um and i found it really interesting that he actually had a background in physics and math and uh arrived in san francisco in 1959 so uh <clears throat> you mentioned that uh he was really no slouch uh when it came to his knowledge and his mm. learning of of traditional uh uh, scriptural text and everything. Yes. I'm a lot more critical of TM than you are in the book, mm. Um, mm. given some of the documented uh, strong arm tactics that uh, yes. the TM organization is used to yes. silence dissenters. And uh, there's a recent book that, uh, from an insider quite high up, called Transcendental Deceptions. I can't remember mm. the author's name. Mm. Um, it kind of uh, chronicles all those. Uh, deceptions but yeah. that aside uh i found it interesting there's a for example there's, a, very, um, there's a, a, a blog written by i think a guy called joe kellett uh, um tm down the rabbit hole which is a collection of absolutely you know you know some of the worst of the tm behavior um, so ah. yeah, um, mm. i found it interesting that prudence pharaoh uh mm. Uh, vehemently uh, denied that TM is all about the mantra, and in, in, in her opinion, right, or that mm. the TM for her, in her view, mm. is firmly an expression of the Hindu tradition, mm. and that seems contradictory then to the public face of TM. For example, how David the David Lynch Foundation mm. uh, presents TM as a purely scientific and secular technique. So, what what's your take on that contradiction? Uh, I mean, I, I think, I mean, she she um, takes a view that um, when she says that um, it's not about the mantra, I think really what she she means is that the um, the mantra is part of, belongs to that whole like the Vedantic, you know, I doubt Vedanta idea of, you know, the um, the self and, the, you know, the larger self. Um, and so I think she actually really takes a, a sort of a more traditionally, hin you know, um, Hindu view of it. Um, I, I, I think, um, and, but obviously, so that, yeah, it was, it was in stark contrast to, to what you, what we read about, um, it just being, you know, a, a fast fix and, um, and, uh, you know, uh, something that can, you know, make you more productive in, in your, on your working life and, and all that. So, but I, I think, I think my view is, is the thing is with this book, it was very, it was, it would have been quite easy to come, to come through the whole field and be negative about everything. Um, but I remember I, I did actually go to a TM induction in London and, you know, I was, I, I was basically, I mean, I'm quite cynical. I don't like the idea of the mantra being secret. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, obviously the idea of the, the higher levels that you pay for uh, is extremely dodgy. I don't really like the idea of anything that you have to pay for, even if it's just, even if with the argument that they, they have, the argument they have is that, you know, you have to keep, you know, the, the central, um, teachings intact and the only way to do that is to charge money because you obviously you know have a kind of organizational overhead essentially so I don't like that either um, and, I, and I know for instance you know people like um, you know Wilbur are uh, cynical about um, you know even even the technique but it's just th there is a sense that for a lot of people you know I think it, Although I would never do it, uh, and I, I, I see it as being um, very, um, you know, I mean, Ginsburg hated it. You know, he was like it's uh, politically naive, and um, you know that, you know, in India, nobody would charge for this teaching. But I, I do think that for, when I went to this uh, meeting in London, for instance, 
you know, there was a, one of the people in the audience ch chirped up and said that she had a friend who had a lot of problems with anger. There's a lot of very troubled individual and that she actually discovered TM and it changed her personality for the better. And, and I think that there is that aspect to, to all of these things. And I think there is that aspect to mindfulness even that although, and, and this is where I think, you know, you and I, I guess, are ever on slightly different paths in, in a sense, because, you know, I, I, I've now read a couple of the Kabat-Zinn books, actually. I've read, I, I waded through Full Catastrophe Living, which was absolutely unimaginably tedious and confused and but as well as his other book and i am um, but i think that there is an aspect to, to these things that that even though people might not be getting like the full the true message that you know that that it's that it actually still has a a validity um or a use for some people and that it, it could be constructive for some people um but you know i, I think I think I was more open to um, mindfulness as, as a positive current in society before I read, um, you know, the Kabat-Zinn books. Um, well, I think it's easy for us in hindsight to uh, be overly critical. But at the time, um, mm. these were, out, you know, astounding new mm. uh, encounters uh, between the East and the West. I mean, when... You tell the story in the book just how uh, Eric Clapton's former wife, uh, Patty Boyd, uh, uh, I didn't know that, that she's the one who introduced uh, uh, George Harrison and John Lennon to yeah. Maharashi uh, yeah. as early as 1967, and, mm. uh, and, and then they went to Rishikesh. I mean, yeah. it's easy for us in hindsight to say, oh, look how, look how bastardized and, and yeah. how commodified it it all became and hey, i guess that's the yeah uh but um i mean but it had a profound effect on the beatles it had a profound effect on especially uh george hmm. uh, and i didn't realize that they were like meditating nine hours a day uh, yes. in rishikesh i mean yeah that had to have i mean and we, we certainly hear the uh the uh impact uh on their music and how that yeah. totally radically changed their their whole approach yeah Yes, I mean, I, I think it's. Um, I, I think it's. Uh, I mean, it's. It's a case of of of, I guess, seeing what good there is in things. Um, but I mean, you know, it's difficult. I mean, I you know, I read, I read, for instance, I read mindfulness, and I, which I thought was fantastic and you know, ex extremely oh, necessary. You. But you know, it was funny. It wasn't really until I I then picked up. What's the other Kabak? Uh, wherever you are, your whatever it is. I read that as well. It wasn't until I read those two books that I actually really kind of felt how necessary mindfulness was because just, you know, I just was such a wearing and, um, you know, exhausting and confused. Um, There's a lot of dribble. Yeah. And repetition <laughs> and just, I mean, just. So, 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 I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I think I'm probably less, um, probably a bit, a little bit, a little bit more cynical of it, but I still have a, you know, a part of me thinks that, uh, you know, my family, for instance, I have two children. Um, my son has started to use an app, a mindfulness app. I think it's called 10% better or something. And, and my wife also has been using an app and her mother has been using one of these mindfulness apps. And, and I have to kind of bite my lip, to be honest, because, you know, I just think it's terrible, but um, but I know it, it helps them. And and mindfulness in itself is, I would say it's probably more like fifty percent of vipassana, and a lot of it is gestalt therapy, and a lot of it is um, uh, self is his hypnotism, self hypnotism. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure. So, so it's uh so so I mean I think the gestalt the whole body scanning thing is is gestalt therapy. Um, I mean, it's, it has roots in Vipassana as well, but but the way that those came together. So 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 I, I think that you know there's a whole load of stuff in there. Um, it's like a kind of a you know a sort of what we call in the UK a skip, a builder's skip, full of um, full of stuff that's been left over and it's all been kind of bound together with sellotape, you know. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, it's quite a collage. And uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, one thing that strikes me um, is just how many of the key figures of the counterculture came from wealth and privilege, and not all by any means, but mm. uh, certainly people like Michael Murphy and mm. Dick Price, who were the co-founders of of Esalon. Yes. Uh, even Richard Albert. Um, yeah. So is wellness, uh, could we say that wellness is an artifact of white wealth and privilege? And and where are the African-American and, and figures in the history of the counterculture? I seem to be absent. Yeah. I mean, uh, the counterculture was suspiciously white. I mean, it's something I'd sort of pick up a bit in the book, which is that I mean, obviously Charles Manson is somebody I talk about in the book because he kind of had aspirations to be a therapist. But one of his um, one of his message, messages of the Beatles was that it was the White Album, you know. Yeah. So, you know, and, Quite and then, a delusion. <laughs> and well, I mean, it is a delusion, but there was a there was definitely a subtext in in all of that. You know that you know, for instance, the you know the Ken Kesey's Attitude Trips. You know, there was definitely a a revolt against. The, uh, the, the 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 influence of black culture uh, it was a it was a, a reaction against it in many ways and and i always think that you know that um you know i don't think it was a coincidence that it was a black man who was who was killed so graphically at altamont i think it was a kind of a an insidious kind of white pride um thing going on and so oh, wow yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's one of the uh, the more unsavory aspects of, of it, which is that it was a that it was it wasn't until you know well I think there's a, there's anomalous characters like Hendrix um, and uh, you know the and, and George Clinton who obviously went out, but I think it was um, very much it was sort of a suspiciously white. Um, and as for the, your thing about wealth, I, th I think that. I think, unfortunately, there is something about, and I was reading recently about uh, this kind of a centre of um, Vedanta in, in the UK here, that's, uh, which I've just been reading about recently, um, that is very much a kind of a upper middle class uh, institution. I think there is something as well that you can see in uh, Indian society with the, the Brahmin caste, where, you know, it does play into ideas of superiority, this very idea of divinity which obviously relates to you know ideas of um you know connecting to the self connecting to something that's more divine i mean the whole um you know the whole strain and lsd of um kind of the messianic strain of you know inflation that you know timothy leary and and what have you there's a very much a kind of sense of arrogance and um and superiority um to it uh you know you know, and, and as fascinating as it, as, it, as it was to meet Stan Groff, I don't think I've ever met anyone who was, you know, more superior. Um, and I think that there is a relation to that. Certainly someone like Aldous Huxley. I mean, I, I, I had a background. I, I went to public school. I was a, I went to Eton College. And, and Aldous Huxley, who's as an old Etonian, and I can see that psychedelics very much played into his sense of superiority. Uh, mm. So I think that you know there, there's there's definitely something there. I think that you know the the book is definitely not it is in many ways it's a, a critique of, um, of of the counterculture's strategies or, or and it's fascinating and, and, and amused on, on, on many levels. And, and of course there are, there's as many you know working class characters like Artie Lang and um, yeah Artie Lang uh, is a fascinating figure. I uh, I didn't know he went to Esalen as well quite quite early, like 1966. And yes. you know, I was a psychology. I'm a recovering humanistic psychologist because <laughs> I went to one of two programs in the United States that was uh, focused on humanistic psychology. In fact, wow. I transferred uh, during my uh, end of my sophomore year to, from Southern Illinois University, which was basically a behavioral experimental rat psychology program i couldn't stand it yeah. and I explicitly i met stanley krippner who was giving a guest lecture uh, 
right. uh, and uh, at SIU, uh, and he told me, "Well, if you really want to study uh, humanistic, humanistic psychology, mm. you should go, you should go to Sonoma State." So I, I, I packed my bags and went, right. and uh, uh, and uh, I was reading. Uh, I remember reading Thomas uh, Sasse's book, "The Myth of Mental Illness." It was, it was extremely yeah. formative yeah. for me because. Uh, while I was a student, a uh, full-time student, I was working part-time at a residential psychiatric facility uh, right. where I saw patients that had been uh, institutionalized for many years, mm. even a couple that had lobotomies. Uh, yeah. And I also had to uh, assist a psychiatric nurse and mm. psychiatrist sometimes in, in administering uh, electro convulsive shock treatments and mm. uh, I was called a mental health technician so mm. uh, we were the guys that would come in and take down you know uh, psychotic patients put them in restraints mm. so I had a, a I had a lot of cognitive dissonance going on because yeah. I was reading R.D. Lang and I was reading Thomas Sauce and yeah. I was humanistic psychologist yeah. and I'm like oh yeah. and uh, then when I got to grip I got to graduate school I was reading Irvin Goffman's book Asylum so well, yes yes um but I think the big question here, we'll get to R.D. Lang. He was a really fascinating per person. Mm. Um, what do you think the big picture was in terms of the counterculture's view, especially after R.D. Lang, you know, came on the scene of mental illness? Well, it was um, it was it was kind of valorized, essentially. Um, it was, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those strange moments in history when, um, you know, it was a. Uh, there's a there's a, a guy who uh, whose memoirs I found is on a fragment of his memoirs called David Gale, who was um, a sort of a, a young countercultural person in London and looking at um, the early work of uh, Lang and Cooper and Burke and their anti psychiatry ideas. And, and he actually says that Lang's divided self um, actually made, you know, madness, you know, fashionable and exciting and um uh, and so you know for the counterculture i mean it was it was it was very much you know hook line and sinker with this idea of um of uh you know it being kind of a non repressive state um natural state um one that was um you know could be understood you know in terms of uh you know eastern philosophy you know voices and um and so you know it was and there was a lot of patience for people like Sid Barrett. I mean, Sid Barrett, got, got of, who's the the early um, Pink Floyd um, singer, there was a there was a tremendous amount of patience for his his behaviour until anybody actually said, "Okay, I think we've gone a bit far here." So it was very much valorised. I mean, something like Kingsley Hall was, um, you know, and in many sense it was it was it was an insane asylum, kind of a free range of insane asylum. You know, it had you know it had kind of um, famous people like uh, you know Sean Connery showing up. You know, it was a kind of a trendy oh. place. It's unthinkable now to think if you had a kind of a, a mental asylum that you know uh, you know Daniel Craig would appear and go and have dinner with everybody. But it was very much it was like um, it was sort of almost fashionable. And you, you, yeah, didn't yeah. R. D. Ling have that famous saying about uh, madness as breakthrough versus madness as breakdown? That's right. That's that's I mean that's almost it in a nutshell yeah and it's a it's very much a sign of a kind of post Jungian idea that 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 that, that the madness was the experience of madness um was a kind of a rite of passage that you know when when the ego collapsed um that you know there was the opportunity for an ego uh, you know a new or better healthier ego to take its place um but you know i mean it's um but yes, I mean it was on a kind of on a sort of street level. It was it was a sort of a you know a very sort of fashionable and uh, you know well accepted idea. Uh, and R. D. Ling did a, a ton of LSD, if I if I'm correct, is that right? Yeah, so he he did you know remarkable amounts. I mean, um, I, I spoke to a guy called Joe Burke who was who was his kind of um, right hand man, and you know he, he you know he 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 did long LSD sessions with Lang where. You know, Lang took enough LSD to kind of stun an ox and was still functioning. But it was it yeah. very much. He, Lang saw himself as the UK's answer to Tim, Timothy Leary. I mean, there was a there was a, almost possibly delusional 
a tale that um, that when um, that you know Lang went to speak to the government about LSD and what it should be doing with LSD, and he saw it as kind of his thing. Um, so uh, you know, he's a uh, yeah, the big yeah. Compliment. Well, there's so many surprising uh, vignettes in your book. I hate to give them away, but I can't resist this one. <laughs> and it has to do with R.D. Lang. I, I, he traveled to Sri Lanka and yeah. India to practice Vipassana meditation. Yes, that's right. And actually, when reading your book, you mentioned um, the Nyaponika Thera book mm -hmm. that actually yeah. Lang was reading. I think it said there's an interesting conversation with Ginsberg and Lang at the ICA in London in 1971. And, and they actually refer to that book. They said, uh, you know, that he was the guy who was responsible for that, for this book. And I think Ginsburg said something like a uh, uh, foundational text or, or something. And uh, there's a, there's a funny little free soul <laughs> between them about, about this, this book of Nyaponica Thera. But, um, yeah. I mean, it's, he was seriously, um, you know, in deep and, and, and he, um, uh, one of the trajectories out of Kingsley Hall for a, a number of people was <clears throat> Tibetan Buddhism under his influence. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, but the thing is, when one starts reading, uh, researching around this territory, I mean, it's almost like you almost expect everybody. You almost almost expected that Adi Lang would spend, you know, three months sitting in the Himalayas with a guy w without any clothes wrapped in his own hair you know, looking at the sky all day. I think the, the, the best lessons I learned were ineffable, you know. So, uh, I mean, yeah, it's like, okay, you sort of expect it, but yeah. Full. Well, you know, reflecting a little bit about the counterculture, I was thinking that this all occurred uh, before the rise of, of neoliberalism and uh, Reagan era and Thatcher era. And mm -hmm. So it, it basically, you know, was kind of coming to a close by the time that's your mm. the early 80s uh yeah. so i mean well i think the legacy uh, that's still to me it it's it seems a bit naive or wishful thinking or maybe mm. maybe more charitably just incomplete this idea that first change yourself and then social transformation will follow yeah it seems like that is uh, a lot of what the counterculture was about yeah uh but One of the reasons your book is it, mindfulness is so strong is is the idea that what that does is it leverages um you know state power onto um you know it, it, it negates the the, na the need for the state to be transformative it's all you know the individual's responsibility and i think that was one of the good the really excellent things in but mindfulness that, that you, you pick up. I guess at the 60s, the background, and this is something I, I sort of pointed out in the book, was that, you know, this was the immediate background was, you know, uh, the Holocaust and, um, and the, you know, uh, the Stalinist purges. And so the, the idea there is that what, how can you trust, you know, institutional society to do anything constructive? You know that it really right. it becomes our personal responsibility. So I mean, so so uh, so um, so in uh, you know the makeover counterculture, uh, he'll say um, you know to to try and change society to re re you know it is just redesigning the turrets. You know. Yeah, yeah, Rozak was, was yeah. that's right, that's right. And but I think we're in a different moment of history here, where we're yeah. seeing just how important the government is with COVID. Yeah. And and when we have a lack of a government response, yeah. and uh, but um, I, I, I mean, I agree. We, I agree. I think I think I think you're right, and I think that it's like, you know, it's one of those things. It is almost like, and and mindfulness is 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 a perfect example of 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 how that we've kind of played into the weaknesses of those ideas. It's almost like you know um, that it's almost created a space that's been exploited. Um, yeah, in a way, we've kind of morphed from hippie, the hippie countercultural movement to a hipster libertarianism in a way. However, I do think that that in terms of personal politics, I mean, certainly in the UK, we have a lot of kind of now sort of virtue signaling politics. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, for instance, you know, they they they're doing a very valiant work, extinction rebellion, rebellion, but. 
we you know we know all our you know young children uh, going to these demonstrations and they're, they're taking selfies on their iPhones and um, and 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 I think that there isn't enough you know maybe that the, the, the you know that the balance has swung the other way that you know there isn't enough in terms of what people are actually doing with their own lives uh, and and you know non-attachment for me the big bu the bugbear is is non-attachment is like everybody is so addicted to everything and that you know that's a big a big problem for any to change is is addressing that you know well uh, another thing i want to bring up because i think it uh she's a legacy of of the counterculture is marianne williamson uh, i don't know if you're familiar with her she is a popular uh new age author but she was on the uh democratic party presidential debate stage she made it hmm. uh where she uh became involved in politics uh and uh she was kind of la laughed off the stage by uh by the elite media Mm. Uh, and she uh, came out with a recent op-ed in uh, uh, Newsweek, uh, and she made a really interesting point. Um, but I found it interesting because all of her books are, are sort of almost like the secret, you know. It's like classic New Age mm. uh, stuff, but she became politically involved. Yeah. And uh, so I think she made some really valid points. She, she's saying you know, it's kind of like a Joe Biden thing, too. Yeah. Uh, that our collective soul, uh, our collective American soul is sick. Mm. And, you know, the, the your last chapter, uh, the title is Sick World, right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, but she makes this really interesting point that, uh, in the Newsweek article that she says, we need to actively align our policies with the tenets of a healthy soul, mm. not only in our private behavior, or on the meditation cushion, but in our political and economic behavior. Yeah. So, it's very I think that's isn't it? It's, it's certainly promising, and 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 you know, it's that it's that thing. I mean, of uh, of trying to uh, you know, you know, live you know a, a better. I think alignment. It's interesting to use that word alignment because that's something that I you know. C comes up as a sort of a motif or a sort of accumulated from reading all this thing of this uh, this idea and, and i think that, that that kind of relates to for me the the idea of buddhism is that or or the or is that the idea that the this kind of divine order what if, if it exists um the, you know the, the, in the 60s the idea was to sort of crash into it like like the sun you know like sort of burn up in the sun but that it rather the, the, the more healthy way to 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 engage with it is is to kind of align yourself with it, and so that doesn't involve destroying your ego and whatever, but actually you know finding a space that and and of course that involves um, maybe in the first case you know working on yourself and and not doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Um, and you know, behaving in an ethical way, in a kind of a you know four noble truths sort of way, um, and that that you know, but but hope you know with any luck, quite quickly that kind of fan out to sort of you know reaching out to uh, other other you know one's integration in society and being a possible member of society. I guess it's quite difficult. I think probably for a lot of us, um, maybe everyone, it, to actually f imagine a way that they could be, you know, a useful in a constructive way in in the grand sweep of society. You know, so a lot of us all kind of backed into these little corners in a sense of little families and, you know, one's friends and being ethical in those situations as much as we can. But it seems quite difficult to imagine how one could live ethically. And actually, one of the things, one of the best things I've picked up actually in the Kabat Zinn book, right at the end, somewhere buried amongst this sort of things, is, is his idea of, um, you know, finding something that you, uh, finding, asking yourself, is there something that you particularly care about? Um, and, you know, maybe there's some way that you can help that. Oh, it's actually quite a useful idea. It's one of the sort of the few in, in the book. But that, that's a struggle, I think, and certainly it's a struggle for me, you know, you know, um, to, to find a way that, you know, I, I could, you know, be uh, 
more useful in a constructive way on the biggest on the biggest stage. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe we could end on uh, your uh, memories of uh, being on a boat ride on the Ganges because uh, when I uh, in Varanasi. Because yeah. I I did that too. Um, yeah, in fact, I, uh, I was very I was very I was surprised and, and well not surprised but I was I was amused. Yeah, but but I had the best yogurt. Um, yeah. uh, on going to the other side, the far end, hmm. someone said you got to go to the other side. There's a guy that sells yogurt at the far <laughs> end. There's a stall. Yeah, and it was it was amazing. I'll yeah. never forget that yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I just, uh, it was right. And you said that, I thought you were hinting at having a, I mean, I, I, in the book, as a, I won't, I won't completely spoil it because it's my, uh, it's a sort of the, the end of the, the end of the book. It's a sort of the, the book's destination, but it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's one of those journeys that you can make. And, and it was nice in, in the, um, you know, in the course of, of writing it is going to all these kind of power centers, you know, Kingsley Hall and, and um you know basel and and you know the you know the the, the big the zen um zen temples in japan and just going to and to you know i went to visit bod gaia and all these for power centers and there's a real sense of in a kind of psychogeographical way of of there actually being yeah. you know uh, places that you know had this kind of power and and that's sort of one of them definitely well uh it was a counter-cultural pilgrimage Yes. <laughs> well, it. Matthew, thank you. This was a great interview. I really enjoyed it. And I recommend everyone to pick up Matthew's book, uh, Retreat, How to Counter Culture Invented Wellness by Repeater Books. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much, Will. Thanks for having me.